Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Newsline at Noon, in a potentially landmark deal involving the two Koreas and Russia, South Korean officials are in North Korea to oversee the first test run of Russian coal to the south via the north. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel resigns as the Obama administration grapples with a number of global crises. Plus, world powers and Iran agreed to extend nuclear talks by seven months, failing to resolve their years-long dispute over Tehran's nuclear ambitions by Monday's deadline. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Tuesday, November 25th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. And we start with news that a joint railway project involving both Koreas and Russia is about to kick off. South Korean officials are now in North Korea for a trial to transport Russian goods from a port in North Korea. For a look at how the supplies will end up in South Korea and what the three countries hope to achieve through this joint project, here's our Kim Yen Bin. Over 40,000 tons of Russian coil will land on South Korean soil this week. What's so special about that is that the coil will actually travel through North Korea. A group of South Korean officials arrived in the North Korean port of Najin on Monday to oversee a test run scheduled for this Friday. This test run will include delivering the coil from the Russian station of Hasan to Najin on a 54-kilometer railway. Once the coil reaches Najin, it will be shipped on a Chinese bulk carrier to South Korea's southeastern port of Pohang. So what's in it for these three countries as they get ready to mark the first test run of the Najin Hasan project? Russia sees a new export route as a getaway to opening up its far eastern regions. North Korea is looking to develop the Najin port to not only export resources like coal from Russia and China, but also to move manufactured goods from South Korea and Japan into Asia. For South Korea, the project will cut down shipping costs and promote more trade with other European countries. Experts say the project might also help mend inter-Korean relations and build trust between the two countries. South Korea banned investments in North Korea after the regime torpedoed a South Korean warship in 2010 suspending almost all inter-Korean economic projects. The government, however, has allowed the consortium to indirectly invest by purchasing Russian stakes in the initiative. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. 138 centimeters. Now, this is the minimum height North Korean men have to be to do their compulsory military service. This number tells us a lot of things. A lack of food, clean water, and medical services in the north has taken a serious toll on the physical health of ordinary people there. And in fact, young North Korean boys are now almost 20 centimeters shorter than their South Korean counterparts. Pak Ji-won has more. Malnutrition, a lack of clean water, and poor public health infrastructure. These are just some of chronic health challenges ordinary North Koreans face. The combination of these factors can be seen clearly in the widening height gap between Koreans from either side of the border. For adult men, the gap is about 15 centimeters on average. For 11-year-old boys, it's even worse, the gap reaching nearly 20 centimeters. Due to the stunted growth of many of its citizens, the North Korean military was forced to lower its minimum height requirement to 138 centimeters two years ago. The dire conditions have caused the gap in two Korea's life expectancy and infant mortality rate to widen as well. The life expectancy gap is 12 years, with North Koreans living an average of less than 70 years, while South Koreans live 81 years on average. The infant and child mortality rate in North Korea is also nine times higher than that of South Korea. North Korean children are consistently exposed to poor hygiene, such as unsterilized water, due to the country's lack of electricity and awful public health system. The main causes of death are also very different. The percentage of people who die from infectious diseases in North Korea is five times higher than that of South Korea. 
taking Germany's case before reunification. The gap in life expectancy between people in West and East Germany was only three years at the time of their reunification in 1990, and it took nearly 20 years to close that relatively small gap. Experts say narrowing the huge health gap between the two Koreas is an urgent matter. Helping North Korea build a reasonable health service is a top priority. A large portion of the cost of unification will be spent on establishing a public health system in North Korea. Experts add that securing a safe water supply and developing agricultural technologies are also required to boost the health of ordinary North Koreans. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. As the United States struggles to define its strategy against the militant group that calls itself Islamic State, one of its key officials has stepped down. U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel has only been in office for two years, and despite some kind words from President Barack Obama, sources suggest Hagel was forced out because of perceived failures in a clash of opinions. Chiu San reports. It's been the greatest privilege of my life, the greatest privilege of my life to lead and most important to serve, to serve with the men and women of the Defense Department and support their families. The U.S. Defense Secretary's resignation on Monday is the Obama administration's first cabinet shakeup after the Democratic Party suffered crushing losses in midterm elections a few weeks ago. Praising Hegel's ability to balance defense reforms at home and addressing external security challenges, President Obama, however, did not mention the specifics that led to his departure. Now, last month, Chuck came to me to discuss the final quarter of my presidency and determined that uh, having guided the department through this transition, it was an appropriate time for him to complete his service. When the former Republican senator and Vietnam War veteran was appointed to head the Pentagon nearly two years ago, he was tasked with bringing home troops from Afghanistan and Iraq and slashing the defense budget. Since then, Washington's military policies have shifted in response to growing security threats from Islamic State militants in Iraq and Syria. Reports had emerged of a rift between Hegel and the administration on the U.S. strategy against the extremist group. Analysts suggest Hegel may have been the fall guy as the Republicans, now in control of both congressional houses, are expected to scrutinize the administration's foreign policies. Hegel will stay in his role until his successor is named and confirmed by the Senate. Some possible candidates include Michelle Flournoy, a former Under Secretary of Defense, and former Deputy Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Now a little closer to home and the Korean military has held its biannual defence drills around the country's easternmost Dokdo Island. Military officials says the country's army, navy, air force and uh, the coast guard all took part in the one day training on Monday with the aim to stop, quote, external forces landing on Dokdo. The Marine Corps, however, did not take part due to bad weather in that area. The Japanese embassy in Seoul protested the exercise, which the Korean government later flatly rejected. Japan falsely claims ownership of those rocky islets. Now, more women in Korea are choosing not to work, burdened by bringing up their kids. The latest figures show more Korean women are staying home instead of staying economically active. Our Lee ji has more. Getting married, giving birth, and raising children all seem to be keeping Korean women from working. In its latest report, the Korea Economic Research Institute compared the country's economic activity rate to that of seven OECD member countries. The economic activity rate measures the proportion of the working age population who are working or are available for work or training. The seven OECD countries, which include the United States and Japan, all have populations of more than 10 million and an average employment rate of 70 percent. For Korean women between the ages of 25 and 54, the institute says the economic activity rate stood at about 63 percent, compared to the average of 76.2 percent for the seven OECD countries, and you have an over 13 percentage point difference. The employment rate for women in Korea wasn't any better. 
A little over 60 percent of them are currently employed, while the average employment rate for Korea's seven OECD counterparts was nearly 71 percent. While women in Korea are struggling to stay in the job market, the employment rate for Korean men was actually a bit higher than that of the seven OECD countries' average. Older people in Korea also seems to be working more than ever as the country's aging population continues to grow. Korea's economic activity rate, as well as the employment rate of people over the age of 65, was more than double the average for the seven OECD countries. Experts say the government needs to introduce a more flexible work system for women, so they're willing and able to work even after having a child. They add reducing the wage gap with men might also help, while also lowering the cost for marriage and childbirth. Lee Ji-yoon, Arirang News. Korea's top automakers, Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors, have raised their global sales target for this year to 8 million vehicles. That's 140 thousand higher than its earlier target and comes despite worsening market conditions due to the weak Japanese yen. Oh Hwang Jie has the details. Hyundai Motor and its sister company Kia Motors have laid out a goal of selling 8 million units this year. Hyundai Motor Group Chairman Jung mong encouraged employees on Monday saying that while the market conditions are tough due to the weak Japanese yen and strong Korean won, companies shine brightest in times of difficulty. Korean exporters and especially automakers have been struggling due to the falling Japanese currency as it erodes the price competitiveness of their products against their Japanese rivals. But with Hyundai Gia's global sales already standing at over 6.5 million units in the first 10 months of this year, the auto group expects sales for all of 2014 to beat an earlier target of 7.86 million. The new goal comes as the company enjoyed a better than expected performance in emerging markets. Sales in India and Brazil rose 8 percent and 7.2 percent respectively in the January to October period on year, while sales in China jumped over 10 percent. Reaching the 8 million target also means that Hyundai and Kia, which together rank fifth in global auto sales, are one step closer to becoming a top-notch global automaker. After selling 8 million units in 2006, Toyota saw a rapid increase in sales and outpaced General Motors, then the world's number one automaker in 2008. Hyundai and Kia will now prepare for what lies ahead by improving quality, raising production and aggressively targeting emerging markets. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, in the global news at this hour, it was one of the highly, most highly anticipated court verdicts in years in the U.S. The grand jury decision in the U.S. city of Ferguson has been announced. For all the details, we're going to pass it over to Eunice Kim for more. Uh, she's been following the developments for us at the news center. Right, Eunice, the grand jury of 12 people have decided that officer Darren Wilson will not be indicted for the killing of an unarmed black teenager, Michael Brown, in August. That's right. That conclusion just came minutes ago from State uh, St. Louis County Prosecutor Robert McCullough, who was in charge of this nearly three-month-long grand jury hearing. Understanding the gravity of the decision of no indictment, he painstakingly reviewed the events since that fateful evening on August 9th, also noting the conflicting accounts by eyewitnesses and inaccurate rumors that had been swirling on social media. He underlined that the grand jury panel of nine white and three black members of the community had met on 25 separate occasions to hear all testimony and physical evidence gathered to make an informed decision. Officer Wilson was one of those to offer his testimony, making his case that he had felt his life was in danger at the moment of shooting. County Prosecutor McCullough extending his sympathies to Michael Brown's family added that audio recordings and transcripts of the proceedings would soon be released to the public. The public's response remains to be seen. U.S. President Barack Obama is urging peaceful protests and police to show restraint. 
And the deadline for an agreement on Iran's nuclear program came and went on Monday without a deal in place. But with both the West and Tehran saying significant progress had been made in the negotiations, the deadline has been extended to July 1st with hopes to reach a political framework by March. Arshin Semin has more. A new deal has been set for a deal over Tehran's nuclear capabilities after negotiations to reach a comprehensive agreement in Vienna failed. Five world powers plus Germany and Iran decided instead to give themselves an additional seven months to hammer out an agreement. The two sides have been discussing the terms of Tehran scaling back its nuclear program in exchange for easing Western sanctions that have hurt the Iranian economy. They will reconvene in December to pick up where they left off. Iranian leader Hassan Rouhani said most gaps had been removed through the talks, while U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said the discussions had been difficult. These talks aren't going to suddenly get easier just because we extend them. We believe a comprehensive deal that addresses the world's concerns is possible. It is desirable. A temporary nuclear agreement that mandates Iran avoid sensitive nuclear activities gives Tehran access to some 700 million U.S. dollars of its assets per month and lets it continue with its nuclear-related research and development. The major sticking points in a permanent agreement appear to center on what sanctions would be lifted and how much uranium Iran would be allowed to enrich. The West has long believed that Tehran has designs on building nuclear weapons. Iran insists its nuclear program is intended solely to diversify its energy sources. Shin Semin, Arirang News. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah oh Jin Ju. Korea's Fair Trade Commission will launch an inquiry into the product pricing of the world's largest furniture of retailer IKEA, which will open its first store in Korea next month. Now, this comes in response to allegations the company has set higher prices in Korea up to nearly double the price seen in other parts of the world. An official from the watchdog told reporters Monday that a consumer group will be tasked with comparing IKEA's retail prices in Korea to other countries. The results will be published around February. While the study does not insinuate the Swedish giant is up to anything fishy or lay the legal grounds to find the company, the commission says the findings will will help consumers make smarter choices and may pressure IKEA to voluntarily cut its prices. Now, a word of warning to those of you who like to catch up on your favorite Korean dramas or other local programs on YouTube, because from now on, you'll have to turn to other platforms to get your fix. SBS and NBC, major broadcasters in Korea, have decided to halt their services on YouTube. Instead, they will expand their content on Korea's top portals, Naver and Dam Kakao. This comes to counter YouTube's dominance of the domestic online video market as YouTube accounts for nearly 80 percent share. The two Korean portals make up less than 5 percent. The measure will take effect from next Monday and will apply to PC and mobile devices. Cable channels in Korea are expected to follow suit. On to some health news. Researchers from Korea and the United States have developed an adhesive sensor that, when used in conjunction with wearable technology, could make it much easier to detect cardiovascular diseases before they strike. Kwon Soo has this report. The high potential for wearable technology has already been predicted by market watchers. And apart from making life more comfortable and fun, it could eventually be a lifesaver. A joint research team from Korea and the United States recently developed a sensor that can be stuck to your skin like a Band-Aid and could provide early detection of cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks or strokes. 
Tens of thousands of microcilia, or hair-like extensions of cell surfaces, have been bedded into a sensor the size of a fingernail. These can then measure fine waves in blood vessels. When integrated with smartwatches or other wearable devices, it'll become easy and efficient to monitor one's health, especially since strokes and heart failure can strike suddenly. While it was difficult to respond to emergency cardiovascular diseases with existing equipment, due to their complexity and high price, the new wearable sensor will be able to help in emergency situations. Cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death in the world. The World Health Organization forecasts more than 23 million people will die of heart attack or strokes by the year 2030. Cost-effective wearable sensors could be the answer for low- and middle-income countries as 80 percent of CVD-related deaths occur in that group. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now staying with tech news and 3D printing technologies have taken leaps and bounds forwards in recent years and a new era has arrived and it's where people can scan objects with their hands thanks to a mobile 3D camera that has been developed by researchers here in Korea. Our Son jung in reports. 3D printing, which has been referred to as the third industrial revolution, opened up a new era where people can access to 3D scanning and printing at their fingertips. Korea's Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute has developed a 3D scanning system that allows users to send 3D printable files from their smartphones. The key of this technology is the free mobility of the device, which the users can easily scan the desired object and send the data in real time. Researchers from the Institute incorporated handheld 3D scanner technology also developed by local engineers. By attaching a small camera onto a smartphone, it transforms the phone into a 3D scanner that works as the user moves the device in their hands. Users can test its effectiveness through simulation before printing to avoid any possible mistakes. The technology is expected to be commercialized by first half next year and be put to use in a wide range of areas. We plan to supply the device to schools with professional designers. Since it is locally developed, we can produce it at one-tenth the price of other foreign-made products. The global 3D scanner market is growing at 12 percent every year. Local researchers hope this new device helps them become leaders of the industry in the future. Son Jung in Arirang News. Now, riding the bus or taking a taxi can be a bit drab sometimes, but public transportation in Seoul is about to get even more animated than it currently is because starting from today, the popular cartoon character Pororo is decorating not only the outside but also the inside of a number of taxis here in the Korean capital. This idea follows hot on the heels of other animation-inspired public transportation services being offered to citizens here. Our Connie Lee tells us more. Bororo, the little penguin with his yellow helmet and orange goggles, is now coming to you in taxis. Starting Tuesday, 20 of these so-called Bororo taxis are running on the streets of Seoul. From the outer decorations to inner car accessories, Bororo and his friends have taken over these cars, much to the delight of Korean children. No wonder Bororo is also deemed the children's president. Passengers can ride with this popular animation character for a test period until May of next year. The fares for these Bororo taxis are the same as other regular taxis in Seoul, and because there were only a handful available, reservations can be made online. We came up with this idea when we were thinking about how to increase people's use of taxis, even if it's not only by a little bit. Bororo is just the latest animated TV character to be featured on public transportation in the capital. Tayo, the little bus, has been literally running the streets of Seoul since March. And with its huge popularity, the one-month test term has been extended until the end of this year. And the larva character is plastered all over a train on Seoul's subway line, too, entertaining the eyes of passengers since the beginning of this month. Seoul Mayor Park Won-soon says the coming of life of these characters is a way to decorate the city, 
and of course, please the little ones. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Unlike the gloomy day we had yesterday, it's much brighter today. Skies are clear and the sun will continue to shine down throughout the day. And the temperatures will fully respond. The top temperatures will elevate even higher than yesterday, hovering in the mid teens across all regions. So let's take a closer look at the readings. Now, the afternoon highs in Seoul and Daegu will reach 14, while Gwangju and Busan will top out at 15 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will be getting up to 14, and Daejeon and Tukdo will see highs of 13 and 10, respectively, while Mount Kungang only reaches minus 1. Well, that's all for me today. Let's send it back to Mark and Jinju in the studio. Thank you, Jian, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. Join us again at the same time on Wednesday. Thank you for watching.